Hello everybody, my name is Resonance22, and welcome to the first part of my intro to Prismata series. I previewed this game during my Twitch livestream on Tuesday, and the reception was overwhelmingly positive. If you're a fan of games like Age of Empires 2, Hearthstone, Dominion, or Chess, then you might be interested in trying Prismata since it combines elements from each of those games. Prismata captures my favorite aspects of Age of Empires 2, and then translates them into one of the most unique turn-based strategy games I have ever played. Prismata also happens to be completely free to play, contains no random chance and no hidden information either. You can kinda think of it as a turn-based Age of Empires 2, but with no map or fog of war. Or you can think of it as a deck building game, but without a deck, since everything you purchase goes straight to the board. Now in case you were wondering, I did not get paid to play this, and yes, there are plenty more Age of Empires 2 videos on the way in case this doesn't interest you. This game might seem hard to follow at first, but I ask that you give it a fair chance anyway, since you might be pleasantly surprised at how fun it really is. And so today, I'll be going over the basics of Prismata, and then giving some tips in order to help you get started. As always, I will have links to everything that you need in the video description below, including Prismata's website, social media pages, as well as my own. So this is currently what the beginning of a Prismata game looks like. For the purposes of this tutorial, I will be alternating between a replay and using analyze mode to look at specific turns. Keep in mind of course that the game is still in alpha as of this recording, so the graphics and UI are likely to change. In Prismata, players take turns spending their resources, building their economies, constructing an army, and then attacking each other until one player has no units remaining. Games last only 5-10 to 10 minutes, but they always feel fresh thanks to randomly generated unit pools that are different each time. Alright, so each player starts with a few basic drones and engineers, and the player who goes second starts with an extra drone. Both players take turns using the resources produced by their drones and engineers in order to buy units from this tab on the left. Units that you buy will be available to work for you starting on your next turn. Prismata contains a wide variety of different unit types, including attackers, defenders, as well as economic units and various technologies. There's also even spells and everything in between. The first tab of units that you see on the left, all 11 of these are available in every game of Prismata and they form the Prismata base set. The second tab of units contains a wide variety of different units that are randomly selected every game from an expanding pool. This means that every game is different and you have to plan your strategy based on what's available. Keep in mind that your opponent also gets access to the exact same random units that you do, so you always have to consider how your opponent might react to your line of play. With so many options per turn and so many different unit combinations, Prismata becomes a game of improvising a strategy from scratch and carefully responding to your opponent rather than just memorizing a build order. Now let's talk a little bit more about the economy aspect of Prismata, and then after that I'll explain how combat works. At the bottom of the screen, you can see the five different types of resources in Prismata, as well as how many of each I have stockpiled. Clicking a drone will produce gold, which is required to buy nearly every unit in the game. At the start of each turn, your engineers will automatically produce energy, which is required to produce economic units, like drones, as well as to power certain unit abilities. The remaining three resources, green, blue, and red, are produced by the Conduit, Blastforge, and Animus buildings, and they form the three different types of technology that you can invest in. Green is generally used for purchasing units that have high HP or offer utility, and sometimes combo extremely well together. Blue is used for purchasing units that are typically strong defenders. And finally, red units are extremely aggressive and offer a lot of potential damage. One important thing to note is that any unspent gold and green resources are actually stored at the end of your turn and then they can be used at any later turn, whereas any unspent blue, red, and energy resources are actually lost at the end of your turn. Alright, so now on to combat. Any unit that you purchase with a sword icon on it can attack during your turn. Some units, like Gauss Cannons, will attack automatically, and some units, like the Steel Splitter, actually have to be clicked in order to attack. At the end of your turn, all of your attack is pooled together and fired at your opponent. Then, at the start of your opponent's next turn, they have to choose how to divide up the incoming damage across their own blockers.
All right, so now we're into the analysis tab of the game, which is a really cool feature where you can essentially replay through any specific turns of a match from a replay or even while you're playing to see what your dif different options were and how they would have actually played out. Here we're going to use analysis mode to explain a little bit more in detail how combat works. You can see that on my turn, I have three attack, which is uh, listed right here. It's coming, of course, from this Shadow Fang unit and my Hellhound. And it's pooled together, and now we're at the start of my opponent's turn. And he has three attack coming at him straight from me, and he has to go figure out how he's going to go defend against that. The interesting thing here is that any blue colored unit with a shield in the top left corner can block. When defending, you have to click your blockers in order to absorb the damage from your opponent's volley of attack. Units that take lethal damage, like this Engineer and this Perforator, will die after I confirm my defense phase. Whereas units like this Doomed Wall, which have only taken partial damage, will survive undamaged because they heal up after defense is over. However, some units are marked as fragile like this Gauss Cannon, so they do not absorb, meaning that they don't heal up after defending. Any damage that they take is permanent. The order in which you defend is extremely important because it decides which defenders live and which ones die. For example, check this out. If I assign two of the damage to this perforator, it dies, and I can assign the remaining one damage to this doom wall, meaning that the perforator is the only, luna, uh, only unit lost here. I could assign uh, two points of damage to these two engineers, lose both of them, assign the remainder to this doom wall, perforator, or steel splitter, and any of them would live, and I would lose those two engineers. I could assign all of it to the steel splitter and lose that, or I could assign all of the damage to this doom wall and lose nothing. There's a lot of finesse to defending, and it's something that we'll explore a little bit more as we get on in the video. So here's the thing. If your attack pool is greater than your opponent's number of blockers, you will immediately wipe out all of your opponent's defense, and then you can assign any leftover damage to your choice of their units. Let's go overrun his defenders right now. This is called getting breached, and it's usually extremely bad and can sometimes even lose you the game, so both players have to make sure that their defenses are always keeping up with their opponent's attack. Notice how I can assign my damage to any, any of my choice of his units, whereas when you're defending, you're in charge of where the damage goes. But since I've breached him, I'm the attacker, now I'm in charge, and it looks like Masterbot's going down. Keep in mind that because units don't take any damage when they attack, both sides will keep building an increasingly large army over time until one side is breached. The two armies will then continue fighting until one side has no remaining units and the other player wins. Alright, so let's move on to the last section of this specific video. So now that I've gone over the basic rules of Prismata, let's rewind a bit and talk about basic strategy. Since every game of Prismata is different, there will be exceptions to these rules, so you can consider them as a rough guideline to help you get started. The first rule of thumb is pretty simple. You always want to mine gold with your drones unless you need them as emergency defense so that you don't get breached. Deciding what to spend gold on is complicated, and in general, you want to spend at least the first turn of Prismata building two drones, which you can see me doing right here. You'll probably buy more drones on turn two, and maybe beyond that as well. The idea is that even if you're attempting to rush your opponent, you still want to have enough drones so that you can afford to produce more than one unit per turn. That way you'll be able to ramp up attack faster, and hopefully produce it quicker than your opponent can defend. After you've purchased your first two drones on turn one, you can start thinking about how many more drones you want to buy. The optimal number of drones will vary widely from game to game based on the available units and then what your opponent is doing. For example, if the unit set contains cheap rush units like this perforator, and we can see that my opponent has built an early animus, then you might need to cut drone production early so that you can start buying defense. On the other hand, if the unit set is completely full, of super expensive units. Let me go grab that image right here. If the unit set looks like this and is full of huge, expensive units, non-fragile blockers that are absolutely massive and contains no cheap rush units, then you might want to ramp up early drone production by producing a third engineer on turn two. You can compare buying a third engineer early to the concept of a fast expansion in StarCraft or a four town center boom in Age of Empires 2. 
If the unit set doesn't contain any huge defensive units like this, then it's usually a better idea to actually store that extra gold on turn 2, rather than buy an early 3rd engineer that you can't safely use. Since every game of Prismata is so different, I always encourage players to experiment constantly to see what works and what doesn't. The optimal number of drones will depend on what units you plan to buy and what type of tech you want to invest in, but how do you decide on an opening strategy? Another interesting part of Prismata is that the random units are usually a little bit stronger than the base set, so you want to buy at least a few of them during your game. You will likely still use many of the base set units though to help support your strategy. The most complicated part of Prismata is definitely coming up with a strategy based off the available units and then tailoring it to meet your needs and, of course, to adapt to whatever your opponent is planning on doing. With countless unit combinations and possible moves, Prismata tests your ability to improvise and adapt rather than to simply memorize builds. This means that with enough practice, you will be able to get a start for a better feel of what works and what doesn't. For the purposes of this tutorial, I'm going to try and keep things simple by offering a few basic tips on how to choose your strategy. The first thing that I recommend you do is to check what colors are dominant in the random unit set. If a random unit set contains literally no green units, then maybe going for an early conduit might not be the best idea. Usually though, the unit set will look a lot more like the one in this replay, and it will feature a wide variety of units. You almost always want to incorporate at least a few of the random units in your strategy, but how many you include will depend on how well those units work together. So let's talk a little bit about my own strategy and thought process in this specific replay. I looked at this unit set and I immediately started checking to see what the most efficient attackers are, the most cost efficient ones, and the biggest non-fragile blockers. Note that non-fragile blockers are usually referred to as absorbers due to their ability to absorb and ignore any damage that does not actually kill them. The ability to absorb in games of Prismata is extremely powerful and you usually want to take advantage of that as much as you can to avoid getting breached. Keep in mind though that not all unit sets will play out like this, so going for the most efficient units will not always be ideal. Sometimes, for example, if all of your units have high HP like this Gauss Cannon, then getting breached is not nearly as bad for you as it is for your opponent if your opponent's attackers all have 1 HP like this Tarsier. Some random unit sets will encourage strategies like this, and some random sets will look more like the one in this replay. Anyway, in this specific game, Doomed Wall is the largest non-fragile blocker in the set, so I probably want to include him in my build if I can. Perforator and Shadowfang are also two both very, very efficient, cost-efficient attacker units compared to the base set Tarsier, which is usually what we're comparing other units to. It's already a very strong attacker in itself. Now, the thing is, though, is that sometimes without available support units or factoring in certain unit synergies, your strategy might not be good enough and your opponent might be able to punish you. For example, you can't just look at a unit in a vacuum and immediately go for a huge absorber-like defense grid just because it's in the set. If defense grid is in a set where the other units are all cheap attackers, you'll probably be dead before you can build a defense grid and take advantage of that delicious absorb value. Shadowfang is one of those units where it can be extremely strong, but it also carries with it a lot of downsides, two main weaknesses that you have to compensate for. Shadowfang has extremely low HP, so it will die instantly in even the smallest breach. And it also requires an awkward double animus so that you can get that three red. Remember, an animus only produces two red. Shadowfang costs seven gold and three, so that means you need two animuses for it. And spending all those resources efficiently can be difficult, as well as finding an opportunity to get a second animus where you don't get punished for it. So I, I gave it some thought, and with the help of bigger and with like a bigger and relatively cheap absorber like this Doomed Wall, I hope that I could defend against any early aggression and then protect my Shadow Fangs later from getting breached. Thankfully, I also did see some powerful support units here, like this Hellhound and Vi Moranax, which conveniently use the same resources as the Doomed Wall, Perforator, and Shadow Fang. There are also a ton of other units in this set that I might want to transition into later, but right now I have my eyes on a strong red and blue opening. Since the most efficient attackers and the biggest non-fragile blockers are red and blue, the plan is that I will open up with a Blast Forge, and then I will build two Animuses. Remember though that this is just a rough guideline, and you still have to consider things like available support units, unit synergies, and how your opponent might respond. Sometimes you don't get to live the dream. While it's important to come up with a general game plan, you also need to keep a close eye on what your opponent is doing, or might do, and then adapt accordingly. 
Prismata is a very, very reactive game. So let's shift all the way back. All the way back to turn two. Alright, so... On turn two, my opponent is going to build an Animus. Which makes me think that he wants to rush me with cheap red attackers like this Perforator. On his next turn, he can build these Perforators. And then, he can attack me on the turn after that for two damage. Now this is when Prismata gets complicated. You always want to have an ideal game plan, but you also have to be prepared to change your plan based on your opponent's moves. There are so many ways I could have responded to this upcoming rush, but I decided that my opponent was probably taking a big risk with this turn to Animus. If I could somehow defend this rush while building more drones, then I could turn my economy advantage into a decisive military lead later on. Rather than mirror my opponent with my own early perforators, I decided that the best response would be to build two more drones and then a Blast Forge next turn. We can see the perforators appear right now, and they're going to threaten two attack on that next turn, which could get me breached. But I have my Blast Forge now, I can build the wall, and I won't get breached. Now one, one thing that's really interesting to point out here is that, you know, when I see, when I see this Animus come down, I could have built my Blast Forge on turn two, but that violates that violates two of the golden rules of Prismata. The first problem is that on turn three, my opponent's gonna buy those perforators, right? But they take one turn to construct, so they don't actually attack until turn four. So he's threatening zero damage on turn three. If I build the wall on turn three instead of turn four, again, if I did this all earlier, right? Like if I got the Blast Forge here instead of two drones, and then I had the wall on, on this turn instead, then it wouldn't really be doing anything. The wall would actually do literally nothing, and that would be a waste. In general, you only want to build defense when you need it, usually. There are plenty of cases, though, where you will want to build preemptive defense, uh, but in general, it's a good idea to try and not build your walls too early unless you really need to. Thing is, is that chances are, if you don't need the defense, like, right now, that wall probably could have been a Steel Splitter instead, because remember that a Steel Splitter of course has the same stats as a wall, it can absorb for 3, it's got 3 health, and the difference is here though is you're, you're paying 1 more gold, but the Steel Splitter can also attack, you can have it attack, or you can leave it behind to block, and if you don't need a defense right now, you don't need a prompt blocker like this wall that can block immediately, you might as well get that Steel Splitter usually. Another important thing that I really want to bring up is you generally do not want to buy a Blast Forge or Animus and then not use those resources, since any unspent blue and red are lost at the end of each turn. It's a little bit different with a conduit because you can actually store you can actually store that green and use it at a later time, and sometimes you really do need it as green is generally a very reactive, utility, combo-oriented color where their units uh, can do some really interesting things, like Force Field can prevent you from being breached. So it's okay to kind of stockpile that green because you might be able to spend it later on something like a Cluster Bolt, for example. But the thing is, is obviously you don't want to have 20, uh, 20 green in storage, and anything, anything that you don't spend, any blue, red, or energy is lost. So you have to really try and be careful with that. Alright, so let's talk a little bit more about my ideal game plan. My ideal game plan here still involves buying at least one Shadow Fang and one Doomed Wall on the same turn. And now this all goes back to this idea, how many drones am I going to need this game? When do you stop drone production? Well, if I want to make a Shadow Fang and one Doomed Wall on the same turn, that's my optimal game plan. It sounds so strong. That way these Doomed Walls can protect my Shadow Fangs, and these Shadow Fangs will ramp up damage so very quickly. And the thing is, is that if you do the math, 7 plus 7. So I'll need at least 14 drones first before I can live the dream and execute my strategy. Getting the Doomed Wall earlier has actually bought me enough time so that I could safely get up to 14 drones and then begin my attack. If I didn't have this Doomed Wall right here, this attack could be really scary and I might not have been able to tech up to two Animuses on this turn without getting punished for it. You really want to avoid getting breached if you can. The thing is that Prismata is a very complex game, so it'll take a lot of practice before you get a feel for how many drones you need and what units you want to buy, especially since you have access to different units each time. In the meantime, we can see that my opponent is ramping up attack by buying a Steel Splitter and two Tarsiers. In the meantime, Masterbot has also tacked on two more drones and a Blast Forge of his own, while I've managed to set up my economy for Shadow Fangs. Now this is, a, this is where the game gets really, really tricky. Once those Tarsiers from my opponent are done being built, Tarsiers take two turns to construct. I know that Master Bolt will threaten a lot of damage and a single Doomed Wall will not be enough to defend. This is because Master Bot can also buy more attackers next turn to sync them up with the Tarsiers. 
I think that this is one of the trickiest turns in the game, like out of all of them so far, since I had so many options. I knew that I wanted a Shadow Fang this turn. I wanted to buy one this turn because I had to counterattack at some point. And this is another really important rule of Prismata. You have to counterattack at some point. You don't win unless you actually kill all of your opponent's units. So you have to start threatening attack. You can't defend and hide behind walls forever. The thing is, is that defense is really strong in the early game, and it can completely negate small attacks, but later on in the game, it becomes increasingly expensive to maintain. If you never attack back, you will eventually run out of walls, and then you will lose. So at some point, you need to fight back, and buying a Shadow Fang allows me to start doing that and threatening my own attack. However, after buying a Shadow Fang, I also had 9 gold, 1 blue, and 1 red left over that I could have spent on anything. So let me go back to this. And so at this point, we can see I've got 9 blue, 1 red, and, uh, sorry, 9 gold, 1 blue, and 1 red left over. I can spend this on anything. But I ended up going with a Hellhound for two reasons here. For starters, Masterbot has a Steel Splitter. Remember, guys, he is a Steel Splitter. It is 3 HP, and it absorbs, meaning that any damage that I do that's less than 3 will get completely negated. The Steel Splitter will just absorb it. Dealing 2 damage to this thing is inconsequential, the same as dealing 0. However, once I deal 3 damage or more, I can start threatening to kill th uh, kill some things. Remember that non-fragile units heal up after taking non-lethal damage. If I attack for 2 here with the Shadow Fang, it doesn't accomplish anything, but the Hellhound does attack as well. It gives me another attack for a grand total of 3, which means that Masterbot will have to lose one Engineer when defending if he wants to keep the Steel Splitter alive. He'll have to assign 1 damage to this Engineer, the remaining 2 to that Steel Splitter if he wants to keep it. And that means that I'm finally doing some damage here. I'm killing an Engineer and I'm forcing Masterbot to go buy defense instead of spending his own money on attack. And this will allow me to stay competitive in this game and not lose. Alternatively, if I buy the Hellhound here, either I kill an Engineer, guaranteed, or I force Masterbot into building a Doomed Wall if he wants to defend more efficiently, because the Doomed Wall can absorb for 4, so it'll soak up my 3 damage in total. The thing is though, is if he buys the Doomed Wall, that's 7 gold, and that's 1 blue down the drain that he could have spent on attackers, and that's going to give me a big edge. The other reason that I bought the Hellhound was because it comes packaged with another Engineer. This, I thought, could prove very, very valuable later on, and we'll see how that plays out really shortly. In fact, I bought two additional Engineers this turn as well for a grand total of three. That way, I could guarantee defend against the upcoming Tarsiers. You'll get, a fear, you'll get a feel for this, like, the more you play Prismata, and eventually it'll become a little bit more natural. And this is where preemptive defense sometimes comes in handy. But I figured that with the most, like, maximum amount of damage that he could threaten here, I'm going to need each and every one of these Engineers to allow me to keep a Doomed Wall alive. And you'll see how that works out in a moment. So let me go skip ahead to turn 9. There we go. Okay, so... Now that we're at the start of turn 9, notice how my opponent is threatening 6 damage, and that I need those 3 Engineers from turn 6 in order to not lose a Doomed Wall. It is generally a good idea to make sure that your defense is at least one higher than your opponent's attack is at all times. That way you can absorb the maximum amount of damage with your biggest non-fragile blockers without it actually dying. This concept is extremely important because getting breached for exact will kill all of your blockers, and therefore it denies you any absorb. By always keeping a couple of engineers or small blockers in reserve, I get a greater flexibility with how I defend and I make sure that I always get maximum value from absorb. The flexibility in defense is referred to as granularity. Okay, so two important decisions happen on turn 10. The first is that my opponent decided to build a conduit. And even though he can't spend the green that turn, unspent green and gold resu uh, resources are stored, so that's actually fine. You'll also find that the extra utility from being able to make something like force fields is huge in denying a breach, and it gives Masterbot access to something like Feral Wardens, which is another prompt blocker. I decided, though, to go for Vi Maranax here, which is one of the powerful legendary units in Prismata. While you can buy multiple of most units, you can only buy one Var Vi Maranax per game. One player can only have one, since it only has a supply of one. That's what the teal colored lines are underneath the units. That's actually the supply of it. Now, why exactly did I buy Vi Maranax? Well, the thing is, is though, is that let me preface this by saying, I think I could have definitely made another Shadow Fang and Doomed Wall in this turn instead of Vi Maranax, and it would have had a similar end result. I purchased Vi because it can actually freeze an enemy blocker for 7, meaning that any blocker with a health of 7 or less cannot block that turn. Suddenly, my opponent will have a lot of trouble defending efficiently since every Doomed Wall that he buys will become a useless popsicle. 
In general, when you're playing with Freeze, you want to get the most value by freezing their largest absorber, or forcing your opponent to defend inefficiently in some way. Freeze is a great way to break a stall and force a breach, but it is only good if you have enough attack that breaching can kill a lot of enemy units. I could have purchased Vi Marnax earlier in the game, but it was a lot stronger on this turn because I had so much attack to back it up. Alright, so to recap, there are a few important concepts that can really help you improve your game. First, you want to make sure that you're spending at least turn 1 building 2 drones, and then you can estimate how many drones you will need total by looking at the random unit set. Second, you want to try and incorporate some of the random units from the set into your strategy since they are usually more efficient than the base set units. You will still use many of the base set units though to supplement your strategy. Third, don't buy defense earlier than necessary for the most part. If your opponent is currently not threatening any attack and they can't get past your wall anytime soon, then you can probably spend that gold on more drones or attackers. Fourth, don't buy technology that you can't use. Buying something like 3 Animuses is probably bad if you have only 12 drones, because you will have a lot of trouble spending all 6 red every turn. Fifth, you have to counterattack at some point. While early defense can completely negate a rush, you have to actually kill enemy units in order to win. Eventually you will run into walls to hide behind, while your opponent will still have a full army that you've yet to deal with. So make sure you make your own military too. Sixth, when defending, make sure that your highest non-fragile, your highest health non-fragile blocker survives while taking the maximum amount of non-lethal uh, non damage. Now this won't always be possible, but you want to essentially make sure that you're not taking any damage for free here, and you're at least getting some value out of absorb, ideally the max amount of non-lethal damage. So if I have a doomed wall which absorbs for 4, I want to make sure that it always takes 3 damage since it will still live. You can help yourself get maximum value from absorb by keeping a near constant supply of a few small blockers like 2 engineers. Also, you can't get value from Absorb if you get breached, even for zero, so you usually want to avoid that unless all of your units have particularly high health. And of course, you can avoid getting breached for zero if you make sure that you always have at least one more defense than your opponent at all times. Now, as we can see here, I am indeed closing out the game, ready to finish this as I'm showing off the various combinations of damage that I can do. And it looks like Masterbot is about to crumble here to my Breach. Gonna go buy a couple more units here, soak up this one damage. And then I get to Breach him again. And that's basically the game. As we can see here, Masterbot eventually gonna run out of units, and that's it. Alright guys, so that's all for the first part of my Intro to Prismata series. So far, I've shown the basics of the game as well as some meaningful tips and tricks. In part 2, developer and founder Elliot Grant will walk me through a full game of Prismata while also answering your questions from my weekly Twitch TV live streams. As always, your feedback is appreciated, so let me know if you found this video helpful and if you'd like me to do some more Prismata content in the future. Thank you so much for watching so far, and I'll see you all in the next video. And I should have, all the again, all the information that you need in the video description. I'll have something uh, up there so that, that way you can, guys can get some keys. I might also give those out during my Twitch stream, so make sure you tune into that. You can find my live stream schedule on the Twitch page itself, and you can also, of course, head to the Prismata subreddit if you'd like any keys there. I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope that you all enjoy Prismata as much as I do. As always, though, keep in mind, this game is currently early in development, and I have very high hopes for it, and part of the way that we can make sure that it succeeds and, you know, rises even above our own expectations is by using the Provide Feedback button to give meaningful, honest, uh, and constructive feedback that the developers will, of course, very much appreciate. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.